Hi, welcome back to McClutchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClutchy and today we are continuing our series by examining 2021's General Maths External Exams in Queensland. We're looking at the multiple choice questions from paper one that focus on introduction to networks. So let's get straight into it with question two. We have a picture of a planar graph. It's asking us how many faces does the planar graph have? Okay, so you would need to recall some information about faces. A face is an enclosed space. So let's look at our first enclosed space. That's A, B, C. So that's our first face. Our second face that's an enclosed space is A, C, B, D, E, back to A. And that's number two. Our third enclosed face is this one here that I've done the wonky drawing on. All the way around from A to D, then back to B and A. That's our third enclosed face. So it would be tempting here to circle a, three, but you need to also remember that the space outside of a network is also classified to be a face as well. So that means outside there is number four, our fourth face, which means B is the correct answer. Something I'm going to say here with our next couple of questions, you may want to pause after you've read the question and see if you can do the question in about a minute and a half. Multiple choice questions are worth one mark in the exam. So that equates to about a minute and a half if you allocate the minutes across the marks. So you need to be able to do them pretty quickly. That means that you need to have some pretty good knowledge up there that you can draw on. So here's question five. The coach of a four person relay team is deciding on the order of the runners. Use the bipartite graph to determine which statement is correct. Now, looks like there's a lot going on. We could actually just ignore the options there and do an optimal allocation. We'll skip that step and we'll just look at each question or each response and see which ones we can eliminate. At the end of the question, we'll actually go the other road and draw the optimal allocation, which is an alternate way to get to the answer. So let's look at part A. Lynn should be the first runner. So here's Lynn's um, allocation. She's only got one allocation that takes you to the second runner. So we can eliminate that as our first option. It's not correct. Lynn does not go to the first runner at all. Okay, let's look at the second statement. Simon should be the second runner. Well, here's Simon's different options. He's got an option of third or fourth runner in the race. And second is not an option, so sorry Simon, that is not the right one for you. So that's option B is out. And this is why you shouldn't guess. It's actually quite easy to do this question just with that process of elimination. Let's look at option C. Ivan should be the third runner. So let's look at Ivan's options. He's got two options, the second runner or the third runner. So that's, at least this time, we've got a possibility. Ivan C could be correct, but we need to think a little bit further because what happens if we make Ivan the second runner? Well, that means that Lynn has no position in the relay team. So Lynn must be the second runner. She's the only one that could be the second runner because that's the only option for Lynn. So if that's the case, then Ivan can't be second. So he must be the third runner which means that C is correct. So we can circle C. Now you could actually move on here, but it's always a good idea to check our work. And if you've got the time up your sleeve, check your work here and think about option D. Is option D correct? Well, let's look at what option D gives us. First runner or fourth runner? And D, fourth runner is one of the options. So if we think about fourth runner, well, Simon could go fourth. Bilal could go fourth as well. And probably by this point, you've forgotten what Simon's situation was. So um, you might want to think about, well, what happens if he is the fourth runner? Well, if he is the fourth runner, that means he's got nobody allocated to first place in the first place in the relay team. So Bilal can only be the first runner because he's the only one allocated to it, which means that D is eliminated. So let's have a quick look now at those optimal allocations that we've looked at. So we know that um, Lynn only has one possibility for herself. That means she is the second runner, which then eliminates Ivan from being able to be a second runner, which makes him, he must be the third runner, which means therefore Simon can't be the third runner. He has to be the fourth runner, which leaves, um, and Bilal's only got one option um, anyway left over from that choice now. He can no longer be the fourth runner. He has to be the first runner. So that is our optimal allocation. That's another way of doing it. And then you can quickly find the correct answer. So either process of elimination or solve it yourself first. Okay, so that was question five, a little bit more complex, but still worth only one mark. Now let's look at question eight. A basketball team, a basketball competition, sorry, has six teams that have completed three rounds of competition 
as shown. So we've got a table or a matrix, okay? And instead of ones and zeros, we've got ticks and dashes. Ticks meaning that they competed against one another and a dash meaning that there was no competition between the two teams. The graph to represent this information has got six edges, nine edges, 15 edges or 18 edges. Well, one of the easy ways we could do this would be to draw it, but that's gonna take a while. I'm gonna draw it for you later after we go through the solution. But logical thinking would actually get you an answer quicker. And this is why it's a good idea to have an understanding of how networks are actually made up. And that way you don't have to waste time drawing things that you don't need to. So the first bit of logic you could rec recall is that every tick is going to, if you were to draw, for example, between the bears and the lions, you're going to be drawing an edge between them because the bears and the lions competed against one another. So those ticks actually represent edges between two teams or two vertices. Okay, so what you could then do is go, okay, well, there's, count them up, there's 18 ticks all together. So therefore, you might be saying to yourself, well, therefore, the answer has got to be D18. But you'd notice, however, that every round is doubled up. And what I mean by that, if we look at the bears versus the lions, going down the matrix for the bears, we can see the bears and have competed against the lions. But if we go across from the bears, we can see that tick is there as well. So each of those edges is actually represented twice, backwards and forwards. So while there's 18 ticks, what that means is you have to halve the number of ticks to work out how many edges there would be. Half of 18 is nine, which means that B is the only possible answer. So that's a process of logic that we're using with our knowledge of how we would go about drawing the network. Now, um, some people like to actually verify that with a drawing. So we're going to draw it. It wouldn't hurt to verify it to check our work if we had a bit of time up our sleeve. But bearing in mind, once again, it's only worth a mark. And that's why being able to do it quickly is important. So first of all, if I'm going to draw it, I'm going to put each of those teams represented as different vertices. And then I'm going to go one column at a time or one row at a time you could do. I, I read up and down. So bears, the bears go versus the lions. They go versus the tigers. They go versus the wombat. That's our first set of vertices. Now let's move across to the eagles. The eagles have a link to the lions, the meerkats, and to the wombat. So we can see our network starting to build there. Let's now move around to the lions. The lions go versus the bears. We've already got that drawn in, so we don't do it in again. The lions um, already had a link to the meerkats there, and we've also put that link into the eagles. So we're starting to continue that building process. What about the meerkats column? Well, we've got a meerkats to the eagles, already drawn. Meerkats to the lions, already drawn. Meerkats to the tigers, we need to add that in. Okay, so we don't draw twice to the same um, place. And then let's look at the tigers now. Tigers to bears, already drawn. Tigers to meerkats, already drawn. Tigers to wombats, let's add that in. And now we're on our last column. So wombats to bears is already drawn. Um, wombats to eagles, already drawn. Wombats to tigers, already drawn. So basically, our network is now complete. Now all you need to do is count the number of edges. This can get a little bit messy and tricky. That's why I like to highlight or change the color. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You could have used a highlight or a different colored pen to go over those, or you could draw a dash through each line just to make sure you've got them covered. So once again, we've verified our answer is correct. It's nine edges. So there's two methods you could go about that. You'll notice that the first method of that process of elimination and deduction, um, knowledge about how a network looks and works, that's a lot faster than drawing it. Okay, here's our last um, question. Question 12. Which statement is correct? Now, if you're like me and you see stuff like this and you're in an exam, you're already stressed, that's a bit overwhelming. Whoa, what's going on here? So we need to get our brain switched into gear and think about what do we know about minimum spanning trees? Well, the first thing we know that minimum spanning trees um, are from every vertex is connected to other vertices, um, but there are no loops and there are no cycles. So we remove any edges that create a loop and we create a cycle. So that knowledge about the minimum spanning tree means we can eliminate A and we can eliminate B. Okay, so our next statement, C, every network has only one minimum spanning tree. Now you might be tempted to think that's true. So let's actually draw a really simple network, a square. You could even go simpler, a triangle. Okay, now let's have a think about what the minimum spanning trees on this would look like. Well, here's one. Okay, so every vertex is connected and there's no loops, but 
We could also draw it that way. We could draw it that way and we could draw it that way. In fact, this um, network, it's only a simple network, it's got four minimum spanning trees. Okay, so we know we can now eliminate C. Now, by that process of elimination, you could probably just color in D and move on. But it's also a good idea to understand what D is telling us as well, just in case we're not 100% sure. So a minimum spanning tree has one more vertex than the number of edges. So just looking at this network ABCD at the moment, we know there's four vertices and there are four edges. But when we make the minimum spanning tree, we drop that edge that makes the loop. So therefore, um, it's got four vertices and three edges, which is one more. So D is the correct answer. Well, I hope you found this super helpful. And if you did, why not tell somebody? You could share it with a teacher, share it with a friend if you're a good friend. You could even share it with us in the comments. Like and subscribe to the channel and hit that notifications button so you'll always know when new videos are appearing and there'll be lots more in this series to follow. And you can even follow us on social media as well. Facebook and Instagram is where we have regular updates. If you've got any questions, probably best not putting the questions in the comments. It can be kind of tricky to answer, but the best way is to direct messages on Facebook or Instagram Messenger or on mcclutchymass at yahoo.com on the email. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Natalie McClutchy. You've been watching McClutchy Mass. Have a wonderful day.